Welcome to East Arkansas. My name is Matt Fryer. I'm an Extension Soils Instructor for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Welcome to our ninth virtual field trip in the Soil and Water Conservation Series, hosted by us, University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture, and funded by USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. We think we've got a good program lined up for you to talk about it. Um, and so to start off, I'd like to say that one of the benefits of these virtual field trips online is that you have the capability of submitting questions to us throughout the broadcast. And we're gonna have our uh, speaker panelists come back at the end and answer those questions that you may have. So throughout the broadcast, go ahead and submit those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So to start off, I'd like to just start by sharing some of the data that we've been finding in our demonstrations across the Delta. Uh, in the area of soil health. And so, um, if I can get my slides to progress here. If you've seen any of the previous virtual field trips, you've probably seen these next couple of slides, but I think it's important to define soil health uh, and just talk about it from a broad sense. And NRCS defines it as the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And so that definition is broad, it's encompassing, it's not defined in different locations uh, as far as science to study and to quantify and put hard numbers. But as you'll hear from Adam and Robbie, um, that these the benefits of soil health are easily observed uh, in the field from, from a crop response uh, over large scale and looking at water infiltration and some different things that we'll talk about. And so soil health really encompasses the three main areas of soil, the biological, chemical, and physical aspects of soil. Soil health is really right smack in the middle of all of them. Um, and all of these different areas really um, affect each other. They're, they're intricately connected. And, um, and so the biological aspect, we have uh, microorganisms, living roots, um, all those different things play a role in the, to developing the soil physical properties, good soil structure, which helps water infiltration, aggregate stability, how well the soil holds together uh, and doesn't fall apart. And then the chemical effects, uh, plant root growth and they have the pH effect organisms. And so all, all of these uh, different aspects of soils are intertwined. And that's one reason it's pretty difficult to study and quantify because there's so many moving parts to the soil health uh, system. Really, soil practices, uh, NRCS has five main principles. Uh, number one is to reduce soil disturbance, as you'll see in this first column in this table. Um, the second is to keep the soil covered. The third is roots in the soil as long as possible throughout the year, to have a diversity of plants. And then number five, to integrate stock um, grazing. And so really to implement these uh, for the first one to reduce or stop soil disturbance, we want to implement no-till to, to stop tilling the soil because that really, um, that, that really destroys the structure of the soil or how well it holds together, um, which greatly affects how water infiltrates the soil and how well the soil can hold water for plants. And really the, the next three um, in the list is implement. By, um, using cover crops. And so just so we're all on the same page, a cover crop is a crop that's planted in the off season uh, and it's not harvested for profit. And so cover crops are planted in the field to provide other benefits, like you'll see in the third column on this table. Um, and a cash crop is uh, typically what's planted um, in the summer months in our row crop situations and, and harvested for profit. And so these benefits in the third column are not um, exhaustive by any means. There's many other benefits, but these are just some of the main soil uh, benefits that we see from, from implementing these practices. And then livestock integration uh, uh, is able to implement for a lot of uh, row crop producers in the Delta, uh, just because uh, fencing and, and such a, it's a diverse uh, area of agriculture compared to, to typical um, row crop production. And so all these benefits, uh, improving water infiltration of the soil, uh, making sure that, that those aggregates hold together really tightly um, or 
say, but the aggregates hold together and then water can infiltrate in between those. Um, kind of like a, a freshly baked cake has good structure compared to um, the dry ingredients of, of flour. When you pour water on top of flour, it kind of puddles on top, uh, just for lack of a better ex uh, example. Whereas a fresh baked cake, it'll really absorb uh, some, some moisture. And so we have cover crop demonstrations in the Delta at 20 different sites. Um, we're taking a lot of different measurements, uh, infiltration rates, um, bulk density, which is how compact the soil is, aggregate stability, or how well those soil aggregates hold together. Um, we're looking at nematode populations and then our routine soil sampling for nutrients and the chemical properties of soil. For the biological side, um, we're looking at any soil tests and, as well as NSTAR. We're also um, using moisture sensors at different depths, and we'll talk about that here shortly. And so first, just to kind of give a snapshot of some of the science and what we're seeing uh, in infiltration rates, we're using the Saturo automated infiltrometer that you see there in that picture on the bottom right of the slide. Um, and so this tells us how fast water soaks into the ground. And so typically when we have, when we implement no-till crops uh, in a field, we expect those infiltration rates to increase compared to where tillage or no cover crop has been planted. So where tillage occurs and where no cover crop has been planted, uh, we expect those infiltration rates to be lower to, uh, compared to the cover crop side. And that's exactly what we see in the first two sites, Arkansas and Cross County, um, double and quadruple infiltration rates and the cover crop side. But at some of the sites, uh, as you see in the shade green and white counties, um, the infiltration rates are either higher in the no cover crop side or, or roughly the same as you see down in white county. And so there could be a number of reasons to explain this. Uh, the first thing I would explain this would be that these infiltration rates are extremely variable across the field. So I can move um, 20 feet um, and the infiltration rate will be vastly different than what it was uh, 20 feet back. And so you'd have to take hundreds of thousands of these infiltration measurements in a given 20 acre field to capture ability that's in the field. Uh, and so the places that we're taking um, these in measurements may not be um, representative of the whole field. Um, and so that could be, that could be one reason. Um, and so the real value of these infiltration measurements are going to come back at year three of the demonstration and take them in the same spot. We have these geo-referenced with a GPS unit that'll get us within three feet of, of the previous uh, measurement. And so another um, explanation could be um, like in Greene County, they did uh, do some tillage uh, about a month before um, I took these measurements. And so in the no cover crop side, tillage does increase infiltration rates initially, um, but shortly after when, when rainfall occurs and that soil, those aggregates are broken down, the soil really packs together well and, and uh, prevents infiltration. Um, and so, so in the short term, tillage helps, but a um, month or two down the road when it, when it rains um, and the soil really packs together, that's when our infiltration rates really drop in tillage applications. So when we look at soil moisture sensors, I mentioned the um, at various depths, 6, 12, 18, and 30 inches in the cash crop. And so what we're using these for, the indirect uh, rooting depth of our cash crop. Um, so if, if the, the moisture at those deep 18 and 30 inch depths are, are moving, then we, we know that um, that water is getting down there, and then we know that the crop is using water at that deep depth. So, in the first, in the on the left uh, is uh, no cover crop side, and on the y vertical axis, um, move up that axis, top of the graph. That means the soil is drier. Closer to the x axis, that means the soil is wetter. And so, the red line is a six inch sensor, and the blue line is sensor. And I, I remove two sensors uh, just to make the graphs look. So the main point I'd like to make here um, in the no cover crop side, when that red line drops, uh, really on both graphs, when that when those lines drop, that means an irrigation event or rainfall event has occurred. And so 
in this case, it was irrigation. They irrigated the fields, uh, each half of the field separately at different times. Um, but the, the red line dropped significantly, meaning that soil become wet and saturated. And the 18 inch sensor did move a little bit. Uh, the soil got a little bit wetter down there uh, at that 18 inch depth, um, but not near what the six inch sensor did. When you look at the cover graph on the right, that 18 inch sensor moved right along with the six inch sensor telling us that water is soaking in the ground at deeper depths. And then as you can see that that line goes back up after that 610 date, um, that tells us that the crop's using moisture at those deeper depths. And so that's kind of what we typically see uh, with the use of cover crops. Um, this isn't always the case. There are some always exceptions and uh, sometimes we see the opposite and that's hard to explain, but, um, but this is in general what we see uh, and it's the case across, across soils. And so really uh, the bottom line is um, economics. And so why does all this matter? Why does soil hold together agri stability? And why does bulk density matter? Why, uh, how deep water soaks in the ground? Well, the goal of, of soil health is really um, reducing inputs, uh, maximizing efficiency, of, of our inputs that we do um, give our crops. So our goal is to reduce uh, irrigation events, um, reduce um, crop protection products. And so we, and the reason for that is we hope to be more profitable. And so this table here uh, put together by Amanda Free and Dr. Bill Robertson, which is our cotton specialist, they've been uh, doing this type of thing for uh, since 2015. And so they've been doing it longer than I have. And this is just some summary of the, the economics of what they've been finding and in cotton. And so the uh, the first column with with numbers here is the um, cover crop side and no till has been implemented there. And then the second column where you see numbers, this is where um, tillage has occurred and no cover crop has been planted. And so first thing you'll I'll make a few points. The first one is yield on the cover crop side is typically across three years of data, uh, about a hundred pounds a lint more than the no cover crop side. you all operating expense and dollars per acre um, is, is higher on the cover crop side but you'll notice that operating expense and dollars per pound of lint harvested is about three cents lower on average. And so in a dry year where we have to irrigate a bunch, um, that difference can be as much as six cents cheaper on the cover crop side, six cents per pound of lint produced cheaper. Um, and so really where the rubber meets the road, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so the benefits of soil health are really uh, vast. I've only mentioned a few, um, but, but the main goal is to conserve our soils, to reduce erosion. Um, we want to increase water input uh, and, and water use efficiency by our crop. And then as far as econo <clears throat> economics for our producers, um, we're, we're wanting to reduce inputs, uh, reduce uh, crop protection products to control weeds and insects, uh, reduce tillage trips across the field irrigation. And so one thing's for certain is that the magnitude um, of these benefits are not universal soils um, the uh, uh, or time. And so how soon we see these benefits occur can be different uh, for different soils and different fields. Um, but one thing is for sure is that it's are, are evident uh, and that all of these benefits need to be taken into account to really maximize profitability for producers. So there's my contact information if you have any questions after after the fact and so um, I just want to remind everybody again uh, that we have a live Q&A panel at the end and so submit your questions to us in the Q&A box and so next up we'll have Robbie Beavis talk about the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance it's a group of farmers that have formed a nonprofit uh, with the goal of educating other farmers about soil health so Robbie Hi, I'm Robbie Beavis, the president of the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance. Uh, we're here today to discuss just how it got formed and, and where we're headed in the future. Um, 
The Soil Health Alliance was formed to help educate producers on how to be more profitable uh, and, and use some unconventional ways to get there with cover crops and soil health and, and those types of methods. Um, we were formed by a group of farmers. Um, we all got together and, and noticed we were seeing each other at these meetings and we weren't getting the information we wanted out of, out of Arkansas. So we came together and uh, with the NRCS, they gave us a grant. Um, to help us get uh, our 50 c3 established and um, so like i said it just started out with a small group of farmers or five or six of us in the beginning um, to to just educate farmers on soil health and <clears throat> because like i said we just weren't getting the information we thought were vital for producers uh, to understand and 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 gain some benefits from from soil health practices in their operations our mission is just, it, it's real simple. It's just to educate farmers on how to be more profitable with soil health. Uh, like I said, that, that we, we didn't want to have a big mission. We just wanted to keep it short and simple. Um, you know, because that, that's the basis of it. You know, too many farmers think that in order to be profitable, it's got to equal yield. And, and really, you know, I understand for landlords, it is more, pro the more yield we produce, the more profitable it is for the landlords. Uh, but for producers, sometimes we just keep spending more and more money chasing the mighty yield, and it doesn't equivalent into profitability. It just it, profitable, it just calculates into more expense. <clears throat> and uh, you know, we we really wanted to prove people what what is the purpose of being the highest yield producer and yet still going broke. Um, you know, sometimes it's it's the margins what we're after. It's profitability, and the best way to do that is cut expenses. Adam Chapel, he'll be he'll be on later, and he'll be speaking, and he'll probably touch on it. But you know, he went in and did some major changes. We've done major changes in our operation to to get to that goal. And the amazing thing is, we haven't seen a big re re big retraction in our yields. We might have seen a little bit, but the biggest thing we're seeing is our bottom line. We're just not spending near as much money. We've uh, we've started working with Julianne Dunn uh, with the University of Arkansas to get better organized on what our what our true who our true audience is we know it's producers um, but <clears throat> we're trying to get better organized and how we have not i think right now we have about 20 members producers and uh, the board the, it's made up of right now producers and there there's some non-voting members of the u of a nrcs uh, just <clears throat> uh, scholastic type people just there for work uh, back up and to help us understand the science behind some of these things. But our next push is to try to get more producers involved. And like I said, we've got with Julianne. Uh, she's also helping us to get our website up and running better. We've been working on that for a couple years, but you know, with it being a producer based group, uh, when it's time to farm, it kind of, we don't get a lot done. And then through the winter, we try to get on it hard and we've now got it pretty solid base and we know where we're headed and so now we're trying to figure out how to reach out and, and, and grow our membership and <clears throat> how we actually want to do that. So that's the big thing we're pushing and trying to get our thoughts wrapped around right now is, is that direction we're going to take. And, and we're opening it up. And, and right now we think we're just going to do it with uh, each one of us is going to reach out to two or three producers that we think will be involved. Um, we don't necessarily just want a bunch of numbers on the board. We want people that want to be active and to help push and, and educate other farmers and bring other farmers in and, and get them to try the, the Soil Health Initiative and, and be excited about it like we are. I'm a fifth generation farmer. My son is six here with me. Um, we've recently just reduced our acres, but we're, we're about 1,800 acres of uh, corn, rice, and beans. Um, we started with uh, covers and Soil Health in 2012. Um, with an RCS, CSP contract that was helping us uh, plant covers. We started out with about 900 acres that year and have been growing, trying to get to 100% ever since. Uh, we're just seeing great benefits that our irrigation is reduced, our tillage is reduced. We've tried to get to almost zero tillage, uh, which is kind of hard to do in the South with as this fall we see is, has been a pretty wet fall again. So we're going to have some <clears throat> ruts to deal with in a few fields, but not many. Um, 
but even a year or two ago when we had ruts we were seeing where we thought we rutted fields up and we'd come back a month later and, and the soil just rebounded back and it wasn't we could deal with it a lot more than we thought was was going to be um, but you know we've reduced our fertility program way back um, you know but the biggest thing with a lot of producers we when we first go into this is is we just talk about the the reduction of tillage that's the big the big first step hurdle for producers to get over is is not doing tillage and and we refer to it as you know the the soil is the home of the is the home of your microorganisms and the biology and every time you run a piece of tillage equipment through it it's like a tornado coming through and tearing the house down and if all your biology is spending its time rebuilding the house it's never building the soil so if we can cut tillage out and and start letting that rebuild the soil and, and get some some good things going and get some uh, uh, you know, pour you know some some holes in the soil for for it to infiltrate, and you know we call cover crops armor, and get a good mat built and get some armor built. So, you know, a lot of your diseases that you get in your crops come from the rain splashing the soil and the soil getting on the leaves. And if you have that armor, you don't get that splashing in the soil on the leaves, so you don't get the disease. And it's just a, a roll. It's just a snowball effect that you know year one. And you know we see great benefits in irrigation year one. But then as the ball gets to rolling, you just see more and more and more benefits. And I know Adam will really get into a lot of that. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about the Green Bridge and that's going to get us. Well, like I said, I've been in it since 2012. So we've been in it for eight years now. And we've hardly had any uh, insect issues. Now, yeah, we've had to spray for worms a time or two. Or, yeah, we may have to <clears throat> have a, you know, a, a specific field that may need a, uh, a fungicide because we get some disease in it. But overall, we have not had those problems, and, and I don't know of anybody in the group that has. Now, we've had, like I said, we've had some bumps here and there. Um, some of it self-inflicted. We've just had to learn, and that's another reason why we wanted to form this group was we've already made the mistakes. So we're trying to cut those mistakes out for everybody else so they can be, you know, two or three years ahead of us instead of taking four to six years to get to where they might want to be. They may be able to do it in three to four years. Um, so, like I said, we're just trying to cut a lot of the mistakes out for guys, educate guys, um, and just let them show the benefits. And, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, we don't even ask guys to do the whole farm. Just start with something. Start simple. You know, if you're scared, you know, I hate to tell people to kill their covers early, but if they're scared of it, you know, terminate early and, and grow, take baby steps and grow into it because we don't want anybody to jump into this and have a failure and blame it on the covers because it necessarily not might be the covers. It might just be you didn't have the right tools or the right understanding on how to implement these things. And like I said, we finally got a good base group. We, we feel confident in what we're doing. And uh, now we're trying to expand it and bring other, other uh, producers into the, to the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance. So one of the biggest things we noticed that, you know, there were two or three of us that, that we could rely on each other when we ran into problems or you know, a lot of times we were we were we relied on the Gabe Browns and and some of those other guys, and we really you know the, what kicked us off and gave us the idea was the uh, Missouri Health Soil Alliance that that uh, there's a group of guys involved in, and we really we, we were leaning on them, and you know then we realized that once we got an Arkansas group based, that we had each other to rely on, and if we were running into problems, it's just that that network of guys in your own area that they understand, you know, farming is farming. You put a seed in the ground, you grow it, but, you know, the, the weather conditions are different in the Midwest. Even Louisiana has different weather conditions than Arkansas does. And, you know, so for the most part, it's just having the localized group, a support group is really what it based down to. We had a good local support group that we lean on each other. And then once we realized we just kept building that support group and, you know, it, it, it actually, another big benefit we saw is once we started doing these things, a lot of the, the research that we weren't seeing, weren't believing in, couldn't get on board, they started getting it on board and they realized, you know, we knew what was happening, we just didn't know the science behind it. We didn't understand the, you know, I call them the $100 words, the big words that I can't even pronounce 
behind the, the, the microorganisms growing and the earthworms and all these benefits that we didn't understand, but we knew. And to get grant money and to get research money, you got to have the science and you got to have the, the research people behind you. And, and we were able to finally, when they saw we were going to do this with or without them, a lot more came on board and it's been a steady growth with, with the university, with even, you know, the industry <laughs> has come along and we're seeing even manufacturers seeing farmers wanting to do less tillage. So, you know, what kind of equipment do the farmers need to meet your needs if you're doing less tillage? Well, if they know farmers cut out tillage, they've got to change with us too. Um, you know, we've had to work with consultants and, and teach them to change their way of thinking and, and you know, not just go out and do a blanket application because. Um, or you've got one field that's got an issue, so let's treat all the fields. Uh, you know, with this program, you've got to spend a lot more time on your feet. I say, you know, off your feet or on your feet and out of the seat. Uh, because, you know, when you're a conventional farmer, you can drive down the road and see if you've got to stand. You can drive down the road and see issues uh, or drive down the turn road. But with this, with the cover, it's, it's, it can be nerve wracking sometimes not seeing your stand for four weeks because you've got such a mat that it takes that long. So you've got to get out and, and do a lot more stand, you know, manual stand counts and see what the fields look like. And which I think that's one thing we do a poor job of farmers. We don't spend enough time. I'd say playing in the dirt, but we don't. We don't get out on our hands and knees and, and visually get into it and see what's going on. We do a lot of driving around and seeing what's going on. And we've lost some of that touch with the land and we need to get back to that. NRCS has a program called CSP. We have three different, you know, there's me, my son and my father. Um, so we applied for three different CSP contracts. And uh, through that, three you could get about 300 acres worth of, of cover crops paid for. So that's why we had 900 acres, but we saw the benefits <laughs> of it that that year we had 900 acres. The next year we dropped, that's when we were farming about 3,000 acres. Um, we jumped to about, I can't remember, 12 or 1,500 acres the next year. And we've been growing every year since. Um, and then one year we, we paid for it 100% out of our pocket just because we saw the benefits and you know, that's the goal. You know, we, we recommend these guys go to NRCS, work with your local NRCS people, uh, get some help on the front end if you're nervous about it to help cover some of these costs. But we truly believe once you get in it that you'll see the benefits and the cost savings that it's a, it's a no-brainer to, to jump in this and, and do it full force. And, and like I said, it's everybody, well, I can't afford the covers. Well, the covers will pay you more than they cost in the long run if you'll let them do their job. With, uh, with wrapping this up, we'd like to thank the AACD, the Arkansas Association of Conservation Districts with Ms. Debbie and Ms. Alice. Uh, we'd like to thank NRCS, Natural Cultural Resource Services, uh, University of Arkansas. There's just so many partners involved in this and those are just three that, that have really helped us reach our goals that we want to get to. And uh, we'd like to invite anybody else that ha wants any more information to reach out to myself, Robbie Beavis, uh, Adam Chapel, Miss Debbie, Miss Alice. Uh, reach out to anybody that's involved and we'd be glad to give you the information and, and help you get more involved. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, I just like to say that working for the working with with these producers has, has been a joy and they, they definitely keep us on our toes and ask a bunch of questions. So I'm really grateful for that. So Adam, well, we're gonna send it over to you and he's gonna give us a perspective of a farmer and, and actually implementing these practices and, and the, the pros and the cons if there is any and so and so Adam take it away. Yeah I'm Adam Chapel. I farm at Cotton Plant Arkansas with my brother Seth. Uh, we farm cotton, corn, soybeans, rice, some winter cereals, sometimes milo and uh, we do it all or as close to as much as possible with no-till and cover crops. We started out uh, in 2009, uh, looking at cover crops as a means to control pigweed. Uh, that weed was single-handedly putting us out of business. We were spending well over $100 an acre to control it. Uh, we knew if we kept going like we were going, uh, we were going to have to quit farming. We just couldn't, couldn't make a profit. So uh, 
I started looking at uh, organic farmers trying to figure out if there was another method besides chemicals and I found that organic growers relied pretty heavily on tillage and uh, that's a non-starter for us because every time we tilled we would bring up a new flush of pigweeds and we'd be right back at square one so um, you know just a lot of searching online and YouTube we came across a guy in Pennsylvania growing pumpkins in a cover crop called cereal rye and uh, I mean, he was planting pumpkins into this green grass. It was about six foot tall. Uh, I'd never seen anything like it. It, uh, you know, and I followed his uh, season. He posted through the s summer, and um, you know, I noticed that he didn't have any weeds. Um, and this was an organic guy doing it with no-till and cover crops. And I thought, man, this guy's he's onto something here. So, the fall of 2009, we planted our first. 300 acres of uh, cereal rye, that's all we could afford because uh, we were so far behind the eight ball because of years of struggling with pigweed. Uh, so in the spring of 2010, we planted into that cover crop and our herbicide bills were less than half of what they were on the rest of the farm. So, you know, we thought we had found the, the cure for cancer. So. Uh, that's it, it all went from there we increased as much as we could every year uh, you know in about 2014 we got to almost hundred percent covered with cover crops and by that point we were starting to experiment with uh, mixes and planting into really big biomass cover crops and uh, it's just gotten better ever since yeah, so the biggest impact that we've seen from adopting uh, no-till cover crops, just basically regenerative farming is the new key word for it, uh, is profitability. Um, we've been able to reduce inputs to the point where even in years where commodity prices are depressed like they have been lately, um, we're able to realize a profit because our input costs are so low. Um, and that's not just from the reduction in herbicide, but you know, we've been able to reduce irrigation, uh, fertility inputs have gone down because, because of the health of our soil. Uh, you know, we, we've cut out all tillage passes, so that's a huge savings. Uh, it's just, a, overall, it's a, been a step change in, in profitability or the, the ability to turn a profit uh, when in years past we wouldn't have had a chance. Uh, you know, it's, it's shifted our focus from striving for big yields to maintaining a profit margin. And the best way we know how to do that is to manage input costs because we can throw the kitchen sink at it and spend all the money that we want to spend and still get a, a very average yield just because Mother Nature decided that's what she's going to give us. So it's just not a, a long term of winning strategy, in my opinion, to focus on just chasing yield only. Uh, it wasn't working for us, so input cost uh, management has been huge. Issues from starting on this journey were the same ones that every farmer faces, you know, it's, it's the unknown, so it's real, uh, real easy to get scared and back out of something, but uh, luckily that's not in my nature. I just, uh, I do things too big sometimes. Uh, and I've learned a few lessons the hard way, like a real hard way. But um, so the first thing we wondered is how we're we going to plant into, you know, a, a, a living, a living mulch. I mean, it was a, it's a common fear all farmers have when they're getting into this is, you know, do, am I going to have to buy a bunch of new equipment? Am I going to have to, you know, completely change the way I farm? And the answer is no. Uh, farmers look at you know, changing disc openers more often as an added cost associated with cover crops or the cover crop itself as a, an additional cost. But when you look at the savings that you can get from implementing these practices, it's, it's a drop in the bucket to what you can offset. You know, just for example, prior to 2009 and even in 2009 when we were still transitioning, we were in the fall, we would, uh, you know, do fall tillage and herbicide application, trying to get ahead of pigweed 
all ready for the, fo the following year. Uh, we would spend a fortune on burn down in the winter, you know, spring tillage, all these things. And, and you know, now that's replaced with $20 worth of cover crop. So, you know, we easily traded 100 or $150 out for $20. I mean, I'll take that all day. Um, so, you know, costs associated as far as monetary costs are, it's a, it's a no-brainer when you look at it. I mean, uh, but there's also going to be some social costs. I mean, you're going you're gonna to stir up the neighborhood. Uh, you know, probably get labeled as uh, the trashy farmer or, you know, the lazy farmer. I don't know. Just, you know, I've heard it all. Uh, not, not worried about it. I mean, I don't, it's, uh, all I worry about is my operation. I'm not worried about anybody else's. So, you know, people are scared of what's different. That's, that's the bottom line. And, uh, you know, if they watch you do it long enough and, uh, see that there's a margin to be had, even, even when times are tough, then they'll start asking questions and trying to figure it out. So, uh, just weather that storm and take it for what it is. It's just, uh, uh, threatening and curiosity. And they, that's, that's how lots of farmers express it. They, they just uh, don't want to admit that they're interested. But some other things we've seen uh, as far as cost reduction is uh, we're doing, I mentioned it before, more with less. So we're farming actually less ground than we were when we started because we don't need as much volume to make a profit. I mean, prior to this change, we were like most uh, farmers, at least that's my perception, that uh, it took a lot of acres to make any kind of money because your margin was so slim and it was a volume game. Uh, we've gone from 10,000 acres down to just over seven currently. Um, and it's because we just don't need the acres. Uh, but on that 7,000 acres, we're we're doing it with less equipment, uh, less manpower, because we don't have to make the trips across the field. Um, so that's been a huge, huge savings. You know, when you don't have to make three or four tillage passes, you don't need the equipment. In turn, you don't need the fuel. Your repair bills go down. You know, maintenance on equipment, it's just uh, it's a domino effect when you stop going across the field. Um, and then, you know, we talked about the savings in herbicide. That's just been ridiculous. Uh, we're probably at 40% of what we were prior to this as far as total herbicide usage. Uh, the other thing we've seen is uh, a reduction in insect pests. Um, I think, uh, you know, we didn't have any cotton this year, but last year we had cotton. Uh, the state average sprays for plant bugs were like four and a half or five times. Uh, couple of sprays for bollworms. Our cotton got sprayed uh, on average one and a half times. So every field got sprayed once, some got sprayed twice, you know, roughly one and a half times. Uh, and our bollworms, we didn't spray at all. Now, I attribute that to increased beneficial populations because we've got habitat for them. So they're, they got somewhere to live. Uh, so we're just not having to rely on insecticide as much. Uh, you know, same, we saw the same thing with soybeans. Uh, we got by on our soybeans with, you know, one application of helogen. Uh, you know, I think, I think the state average was two sprays for uh, worms in soybeans. So we were half of everybody else and, and got by with helogen. Reduction in insects has been huge. I hear all the time about green bridge and, you know, you're going to, cause insect problems with cover crops? Well, not if you use your head and just use some common sense. I mean, don't, don't uh, exaggerate monocultures. Don't plant soybeans into winter peas. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. Uh, you know, get diversity in your cover crop mix and your crop rotation. And a lot of these insect pests will reduce on their own, uh, you know, it's uh, it's just not something we've seen the green bridge problem. I mean, we we're we're very adamant about scouting our cover crops prior to planting, just in case we 
if there is a problem, we're going to head it off. But we've yet to have lose a crop to cutworms or you know slugs or any of these things that I hear about all the time manifesting in cover crop and then moving to a, a cash crop. I, I've yet to see that. Uh, but again, we rely on diversity in our cover crops. A diverse uh, habitat will bring diverse insect populations. I mean, that's just how it works. So, you know, we're less than half or close to half, depending on the season, how hot and dry it is, on irrigation to, year, to comparable, you know, weather years prior to this transition. Um, you know, we're, we're watering half as much, so half the pumping cost, you know, half the time in the field working with it. So that, that's some more savings that we've realized. And we're attributing this to increased infiltration rates, you know, a really thick mulch on the ground, keeping, keeping uh, moisture loss from uh, evaporation to a minimum, uh, cooler soil temperatures in the summer. You know, that insulative property of the cover crop is huge. Uh, and then also increased root volume on our cash crops. I mean, we're, we're making roots on crops that are just ridiculous. Uh, we, uh, last year we had a uh, irrigation, we were in the irrigation uh, deal that the U of A does. Uh, we had uh, moisture sensors, I think it's the standard for everybody, at 6, 12, 18, 24, and 30. Um, we were seeing a depletion of the zones at 24 and 30 inches prior to the top levels. So to us, and we ground truth this, we dug some plants up, we had soybean roots at those depths depleting moisture prior to the to the upper upper level. So if we'd have just went out there and, you know, done it by eye or whatever, you know, we just we didn't have to irrigate as much, but the top was always wet looking uh, because our roots were pulling from so much deeper. So that's access to, you know, more nutrients. I mean, we're not just farming the top six inches; we're farming 30 inches plus. I mean, it's it's been huge to fertility reduction and irrigation reduction. I mean, it's it's just uh, there's just advantages abound. You just got to jump in there and and find them. As far as what cover crops to plant and how complex mixes have to be, it doesn't have to be 10 or 15 way blends. I mean, that's, you know, there's, there's uh, conflicting theories on that. But uh, I like to keep things pretty simple, but also have some diversity. And, you know, when I started, uh, I was just grass, just cereal rye, because that's, all I'd seen on YouTube. I didn't know much about anything else till I dove in the rabbit hole. But we, uh, when we did start doing mixes, you know, we would just uh, use a seed cart and have our grass in the seed cart, and then put our broadleaf species in as we ran the grass up the up the auger. So really rudimentary. I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy. Now we've got a big. Uh, 15,000 pound seed mixer. So we can do 15,000 pounds at a time. Um, and with the amount of acres we cover every fall, we, that was, became a necessity. But, you know, um, all of that has led to treating our own seed, uh, saving and cleaning uh, conventional varieties of well, rice and soybeans and wheat primarily, uh, you know, this year, 70% of our soybeans were varieties that we planted last season, cleaned and saved, because they are conventional varieties, university varieties that uh, don't have tech fees, don't have protections on them. And uh, they're good varieties. You know, I hear all the time that this new stuff from the big companies yields so much better than the university varieties. Well, I've not found that to be the case. Uh, you know, we had a study last year, a, a, a conventional variety trial planted in June. Uh, the lowest, I think, was 58 bushels and the highest was 72. For June planted beans, I'll take that every year till I retire. And I don't know that there's a 
variety on the market that it's going to do better than that. Yeah, they may do just as good, but you know, where I paid market value for my beans and a little bit of time cleaning, you know, the other varieties are what sixty-five, seventy dollars a bag. Uh, so, where's the added value? I don't, I don't see it. Uh, but that's just me. I mean, I, I like to do things myself and cut out as many hands in my pocket as I can. So, uh, you know, that's not for everybody. Uh, a lot of people like the convenience of the added technology, uh, and they don't mind paying for it. And if that's a winning strategy for you, that's fine. It's just uh, not something I, I like to do. You know, and making big yields is not as easy as just putting on this product or this fertilizer. If it was, everybody would be making 100 bushel soybeans, 300 bushel corn. It just doesn't work that way. You, know, you can add everything that you want to add, and the weather can make it or break it. That's, that's just how it works. Uh, so chasing big yields, uh, strategically just doesn't make sense. I mean, if you're in this for the long haul, base hits, you know, reduce inputs, manage risk, and regenerative farming can help you do that. I mean, it's cover crops, no-till, reducing inputs. It, it's just a winning formula. Thanks, Adam. Um, as we get ready for our live Q&A answer session, uh, I'd like to just remind you to submit those questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but before we get there, uh, we have a few poll questions. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd fill those out for us, uh, and, and we'll just jump right into our live Q&A. So the first question here we have uh, directed uh, toward Adam. Uh, maybe Robbie can, can comment on this when Adam gets done, but um, why did you choose Cyril Rye? To, and then what would someone who, who needs to get rid of hayfield use? Well, I chose cereal rye because that's what I saw on YouTube. Um, you know, that pumpkin farmer, organic pumpkin farmer being as clean as he was in June with no herbicides and no tillage uh, just made perfect sense to me. And, uh, you know, so cereal rye is what I did. I That's the long and the short of it. I didn't know about much else. And, uh, that looked to be pretty successful, so that's what I tried. Uh, as far as what to use in a pasture to get rid of pigweeds, I, that I don't know. Uh, you know, seems to me like the experience I've had with uh, cattlemen is that uh, overgrazing is the biggest uh, problem in the pasture when you have uh, pigweeds. You know, the you you trim down that grass so much it gives the pigweed an opportunity to to emerge and uh, in the little bit of grazing animal integration i've done i try to leave uh, about a foot of of biomass on top of the soil so i'll graze down to a foot and then move them on and that seems to keep pigweeds from emerging so i don't know that there's necessarily a uh, specific crop a cover crop that you need to try uh, may would just could be as easy as uh, changing your management strategy with the animals. Uh, but again, I'm not a cattleman. That's just uh, observations I've I've made. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, when you talk about we control sunlight and fluctuating soil temperatures are a major influence on weed seed germination. When you have a uh, bare soil or really short grass, that, that that's going to happen. Um, so I'd agree with that. Rob, you got anything to add to that? I mean, the only thing I would add is, you know, like Adam said, the grazing too close just because the other thing that pigweed's nemesis is shade. If you've got plenty of shade on the ground, that's why people like drilling and going to narrow row with, with crops is the faster we can get them to shade, um, the quicker we can stop the pigweed. So that's another you know, if, if you're overgrazing, you're having soil, you know, exposure, and that's allowing, you know, the, the pigweeds to germinate. I've seen where there's been germinated pigweeds, but the uh, soybeans lap quick enough and get them shaded, and that was enough to, to cut that, you know, cut that flush out. But if there's any sunlight getting in there, you know, the pigweeds tend to keep flourishing. So um, shade is a big help. And that, like I said, like Adam said, leaving a foot of, a foot of cover on the ground is, is adding quite a bit of shade. 
So we on to our next question. Um, what types of cover crops are farmers finding most effective in both a long-term and short-term capacity? And then is there a noticeable difference in the soil values with different cover crops? And soil values, I would expect they mean soil benefits. Um, so, so what cover crops are farmers finding most effective in long and short term? And then are there any noticeable difference uh, among cover crops and the soil benefits? Adam, you wanna start that? Yeah, um, so, you know, when we're designing the program, we, we put most of our emphasis on grass. Uh, and for that's for a few, several reasons, but uh, primarily above ground biomass and below ground root mass. Grasses are just unrivaled in both of those areas. Um, and then with the root mass from the grasses, as far as soil values, the exudates from those grasses are just massive. Uh, so if you want to build soil life, you know, micro and macro fauna, you need to start with a grass. Um, and two of the grasses that I really like are oats, specifically Cossack oats, and uh, of course, cereal rye. Those are both really good, got great roots, and provide a bunch of above ground biomass. So really pumping carbon and, you know, other exudates in the soil. And if the soil is left undisturbed over a four or five year period with that base of grass, you're really gonna start seeing some changes in your soil, uh, porosity, friability, reductions in bulk density, just, you know, th just it's just gonna come alive. I mean, you can you can dig up roots and in, in, in most cases see uh, mycorrhizal fungal associations if the colony is big enough you can actually see it with your naked eye I mean it's it's a big deal so if I was going to start uh, I would go heavy grass um, another thing I've noticed is if you have a lot of soybeans in your rotation you probably don't need a lot of lagoons um, you know we we get a, a lot of benefit from the soybean after the fact and it's not necessarily re really to load up your cover crop mix with legumes. You know, it's not bad to throw one in there for a blooming plant or diversity for other benefits, but if you're following soybeans with corn, early on, I would think you would have needed to really load up with legumes, but I'm finding that that's not the case. Uh, you know, stick with your grass base, put a brassica in there and, and kind of break that lagoon cycle. Um, that's just what I'm seeing long-term on our place. You know, legumes have their place, but if you have, if you got heavy soybeans in your rotation, they may not be the best thing for you. Um, is it, did that get it, Matt? Yeah, it sounds good to me. Uh, and I'd, I'd agree uh, with that. I'd also uh, add on that um, for the, for, you know, to, to keep your goals in mind, um, what cash crop are you planting? Um, Adam mentioned it, that you don't want to follow a grass cash crop. Uh, you don't want it to follow a, a solid grass cover crop. And so diversity in there is, is very crucial to avoiding any potential problems. Um, Rob, you got anything to add to that? No, you know, like Adam said, if, if you're scared, start simple, you know. Um, any cover's better than no cover. You know, I, I'm not a fan of wheat, but, you know, it's better than, than tillage and nothing. So just keep it simple when you start and, and gain some confidence with what you're doing. And, uh, you know, reach out to me or Adam or Tim Smith or any of the guys that have been in this if, if you've got a lot of questions because they can guide you, you know, we or we might know somebody for your specific question to guide you in the right direction because, like you said, the key is, remember what your goals are and, and keep focused um, on that. That sounds good. I know there's a lot of caveats to information that we're presenting today and uh, there's some details that, that may need to be hashed out for your specific situation. So always, always consult your county agent or contact these guys that have been doing this for a while with Arkansas Soil Health Alliance. Um, so moving on to our next question. Um, have the use of cover crops or other soil conservation techniques been shown to benefit 
wintering waterfowl or other wildlife. I'll, I'll start on that one uh, and, and Robbie and Adam, y'all can add if you'd like. Um, yeah, the benefits are, are there for, for other wildlife. Um, uh, for waterfowl, maybe not so much because typically um, our waterfowl is gonna be going to flooded areas. Um, and so the, where we have a cover crop plant, it's not gonna be flooded. Uh, it provides habitat for, for other wildlife during the winter. Um, and so that, that can certainly be a benefit. But Adam, Robbie, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, if you really look at a lot of uh, the mixes we're planting, if you go to the store and look at what they're putting in their wildlife mixes, food plot mixes, it's the same thing. So for far as deer, it's, it's great for deer, um, which in some cases is good, in some cases is bad, because if you've got a good deer population and you're just going to increase it, well, then that runs into your cash crop. We've had problems with deer and and our soybeans, um, you know, I know in certain areas, the fact that uh, I've had neighbors that are bird watchers and they've told me that the fields where I'm keeping covers, um, they're seeing a lot more diversity in birds um, and seeing birds that they hadn't seen in a long time. Um, I know quail are coming back because you're not tilling, you're leaving some cover, it gives the, the quail some protection. So for birds, it's, it's a big help. Um, you know, like I said, waterfowl were typically flooding. Um, so, uh, you know, now geese, certain certain covers geese love and certain covers geese don't like. So depending on your mix and where you're at, you may have to be careful on your mix because of geese. Uh, but I do know that we've we've had some geese problems before. Uh, so that that's something to keep in mind, too. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I know when uh, Stuttgart area, they have a big problem with geese. Uh, and so grazing their cover crop down. Adam, you have anything to add to that or should we move on? We'll move on to the next question. Uh, this would be for both of y'all. Um, do y'all have any recommendations on books on the topic that you would uh, recommend? Have y'all been digging through any books, Adam? Yeah, I have. I, uh... I'm, I'm a pretty relentless reader when it comes to this kind of stuff. Uh, some that I would start with, uh, you know, Gabe Brown's just another farmer. He's got a great book, Dirt to Soil. You know, that's a good one. Uh, David Montgomery is a great artist on the topic, or uh, author on the topic, sorry. Uh, one that I would read is uh, uh, Dirt, The Erosion of a Civilization. That is a great book. Uh, Mycorrhizal Planet is another book that is just mind bending. Uh, you know, if you're a soil nerd, if you like this kind of stuff, you know, otherwise they may not be for you, but uh, I've got a whole list of books that I've read or in the process of reading. Uh, so I could, I don't know if there's a way for me to put that list out here for this thing, if y'all are going to have something up later, but I, I wouldn't mind doing that. But yeah, there's several great books on that subject. Um, so pretty, pretty deep topic. Um, yeah, we can get, we can get uh, y'all connected and get that out to them. Um, I could also say that our extension agents will be information. Um, we're also working on a Arkansas Soil Health guidebook um, currently. And so uh, hopefully that'll be out fairly soon. So uh, our next question, um, are there any suggestions for wet falls and later crop harvest such as this year? Is there a trick to aerial seeding? Um, I, I guess I'll start on that. As far as brassicas go, um, they do most of their growth in the fall. And so past about uh, middle of October um, is really kind of the ideal cutoff date for those. Um, so if you're getting Getting past middle of October, uh, 1st of November, I would say that brassicas are out of the question. Uh, and Adam and Robbie can uh, give their input on that from their experience. Um, but uh, grasses have the, the longest uh, planting window um, to, to get the growth because they do most of their growth in the spring and, and legumes have a little bit larger um, planting window. So Adam, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so we're getting too late to aerial seed brassicas, like uh, Matt said. It's just, and really, 
you may, if you can drill some and make sure they get up and you got a good warm couple of weeks, you could possibly still utilize brassicas at this point, but it's getting pretty late for those. Uh, aerial seeding in general uh, requires a seed that's small uh, and spreads good. So like oh, the oats that we use don't aerial seed well at all. Winter peas don't aerial seed at all very well. You need to stick with things like uh, rice, barleys, uh, you know, uh, clovers for legumes, aerial seed well, uh, things like that. And as far as the window to plant, I mean, I've planted uh, pure grass mixes in uh, late January and had great cover come 1st of May. So, uh, you know, you just got to pick your spots. I mean, uh, this is all good things to know before you buy seed because some salesmen are still sell you brassicas in the middle of January. <laughs> it's just, uh, so, but yeah, grasses, you could probably get on up into the first part of February and still get a pretty good ground cover. Now, one thing I will say, if you're planting late like that, you can't rely on tillering. You got to up your seeding rates. So the later you get, the more seed you need to plant. So just keep that in mind also, uh, whether it's aerial or, you know, drill or however you're doing it. All right, thanks, Adam. Um, so we're running out of time, but any questions uh, that, that didn't get answered, we'll uh, follow up with those uh, after the fact. And I think we can post uh, the book recommendations to our uh, soil and water conservation website. And so we just like to thank you all for joining. Thanks for all the que uh, questions that you submitted. It was a very interactive and enjoyable broadcast. And so we'd like to thank uh, USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service for funding this. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining us for the Soil and Water Conservation Virtual Field Trip. This broadcast is funded by NRCS and produced by the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. To find out more about soil and water conservation, visit uaex.edu.